Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Paul Levine. We're going to be speaking about axial length and making myopia management mainstream on the Myopia Podcast. Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Thank you for joining me for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Today, we're joined by Dr. Paul Levine, and we are super stoked to have you. Paul, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, one of the one of the things that I, I know many people know about you is that you uh, just finished tenure as the uh, president of the American Academy of uh, uh, Orthokeratology and Myopia Control. So it's uh, Hopefully, you're feeling a little bit of breath of fresh air uh, coming down off of that mountain. Um, but uh, yeah, introduce yourself. Tell everybody a little bit about you and your practice and what you do. Sure. Yes. Thank you for having me on. It's uh, it's a great Absolutely. honor to be in your podcast, and um, uh, and I'm really um, I'm really happy to talk about this stuff, uh, the myopia stuff in particular. So um, my name is Paul Levine, as as David said, and um, I practice in a town uh, just a little bit west of Boston, Massachusetts. We uh, started the practice 18 years ago, and um, I've probably spent the last 15 years doing, you know, various types of myopia management, you know, it primarily started with orthokeratology and then it's kind of morphed into, you know, what we see it as today with, with all the, with all the different options. So um, it's great. I love it. It's, it's the most rewarding and fun part of what I do. Cause I am a primary care, you know, practitioner. So I do see plenty of, like I say, primary care, but, you know, with a super subspecialty here in the myopia management sphere. So I, I just love it. It's the greatest thing that I think is happening in optometry right now. Yeah. Yeah. So we were just talking about how it's, it's continues to catch on and myopia management's becoming a, a bigger thing, you know, and uh, I think there's people who, who finish up a residency or come out of optometry school and, they're like ready to go and do tons of glaucoma, right? That's their specialty. And, and they go into a VA or a medical center and that's what they do. Um, but myopia management within the realm of contact lens residencies is, is only a small part, unfortunately, of even some of the residencies that are out there that do any of it. <clears throat> so most of us who do myopia management are like you and me, right? We've got this primary care practice that we started. We do glasses and contact lenses, and then we start seeing some kids come in. Um, how do you think that is going to continue to evolve? You know, I think uh, as as I think about that, that's the way we're gonna we're gonna conquer this disease is primary care, right? Wouldn't you agree? It is primary. You know, I mean, yes, it's a specialty. And, and those of us that choose to specialize in this, you know, do present ourselves as specialists. But, you know, myopia, certainly what's more primary than myopia, right? True. The reason yeah. why do people become optometrists? Because they're either myopic or their parents are optometrists. I mean, you know, like, so <laughs> this is what we do. This is our this is our breadbasket. Like this is primary care. Right. Um, right. And. And the primary care brings these patients to your office. And it's really up to you to then guide them the right way, whether you do myopia management yourself. Um, I suppose we all manage myopia in some way, shape, or form. I mean, prescribing a pair of glasses theoretically is managing myopia, but it's not proactively um, taking a role in trying to drive where that myopia ends up. I mean, that's really, I think, the biggest difference. Um, and so, um, I, I, I think that to your point, um, a lot of kids are coming out of school, really proficient at ocular disease. I mean, I'm, I, I work with fourth year students. I've had residents in my office and I'm really impressed with the breadth of knowledge that these, um, these young doctors are coming out of school with when it comes to managing, you know, disease. Um, and, um, and, and, but they're yearning for more because like we talked about before the podcast started, 
there's so much education now. Every journal article, every magazine, every you know email that you get talks about myopia and and how to deal with it in an appropriate way. And so I think a lot of these young uh, docs are coming out of school wanting more of this stuff. So we're start. It, it has to start at the school level, and I think it's starting to gain some momentum at the school levels. You're seeing more and more myopia clinics open up at the at the colleges of optometry. But I still think that the education is lacking in it, and a lot of it ends up becoming, you know, after graduation, um, right, right. you know, how you sort of decide so that, you want to focus your practice. Yeah, that falls on things like the academy, and it falls on industry and, and so forth to kind of pick that up. And, uh, you know, that's just it. As I look what three years from now is going to look like, we're going to have a lot more products. We're going to have spectacle lenses. We're going to have uh, maybe a, a, a branded atropine on the market. All these sort of things are going to come down the pipeline. And what I'm, what I'm hoping for is that the days of, uh, yeah, I hope for this, but I don't hope for this, of myopia management being a specialty is kind of fading away, right? There'll still be some people who refer to me because there's a challenging case or something. But, you know, by and large, I get referred patients all the time. And I'm like, no, you take care of them, right? I want those people to take care of them because they're doing myopia management. What's it going to take, right? What do we got to do to get 40,000 people doing myopia management as opposed to 5,000? Well, isn't that a good question? Um, You're welcome. You know, and one that I certainly don't have an answer <laughs> to, but, you know, I, I, I have some thoughts on it. I mean, you're absolutely right. You know, it, there'll always be a subspecialty of things like ortho K, you know, I, because I just don't think every eye doctor out there is going to want to do what it takes um, to learn the the art and science of ortho K, even though it's getting so much easier, there's so many wonderful products on the market, and um, and with the advent of software and and who even knows AI and you know all the things that are going to start to make fitting lenses so much easier. Um, but I think that will maintain kind of a smaller specialty. But the larger picture is absolutely to your point between soft lens, soft lenses that are available, atropine that's available and God willing spectacle, you know, lenses that are available outside of the U S will, will make it their way here. Um, I, then I think managing myopia with, with those options is really going to be um, very much standard of care and, and primary care. And yes, like you said, you will refer some of the more challenging cases to your fellow colleagues um, or your orthokeratologists. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, but I think as these products become more available, it, it's, it, you know, it's just going to become really easier to do. I, I think that adopting the concept of axial length measurement is a big step in the, in the right direction. Um, you know, because it, you know, it's, as somebody who's been using one for many years now, I can tell you that, it does change your approach. It changes your uh, how you assess a situation. Um, and it's really nice to have objective data because so much is subjective. And, and, yeah. and we all know, any of us who've been practicing optometry for a period of time knows that it's really easy to overmine us myopes because we don't really know how myopic they actually are. I mean, yes, we could cycloplege everybody, um, but people don't live their lives cycloplegied. So, no. you know, the dry refraction, I think is more important in some ways, but when you can see that axial length, either stabilize or progress, you know, you know, that it changes the ball game a little bit. And so I'm really hopeful that that becomes the device that everyone has to have, you know, just yeah. like we all have to have an OCT if we want to manage glaucoma. So I think we're all going to need to be able to measure axial lengths and, that stuff is getting more and more available. They're building it into auto refractors. And, um, and at some point, I don't think there'll be an excuse not to be measuring it. Yeah, no. So I think axial length really kind of helps open everybody's eyes to what's happening and the realization that myopia is not a refractive number, but rather it's, uh, it's 
it's the the amount of stretching that is occurring to tissue yeah. and no more way of understanding that than to realize the elongation of somebody's retina i had a uh, just about two hours ago i had a patient who came in for a second opinion who had an eye exam about six months ago and they they, they were noticing the blurry vision and uh, the doctor i i read the chart and the doctor said you know have the patient consider myopia management since they've progressed three quarters of a diopter in the last year um patient will think about it right I think the the big the big concept around that is no longer do we let people think about things. What we do is we 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 bring them back. They need to come back into the office within about a month or two, so we can keep monitoring and keep managing. And I think the the real clinical thing that that struck me with regards to that was the realization of that uncorrected refractive error drives progression of myopia. So if we have somebody who goes away and progresses a half a diopter in six months, that uncorrected half diopter is going to drive them to become more myopic in the second half of the year faster than the, the corrected myopia did in the first half of the year. And this particular young lady had progressed in the last six months from a minus 150 to a two and a quarter. It wasn't really a, a surprising a, astonishment, but... You know, I'm relatively new to axial length. I'm not. I'm not uh, afraid to say I'm a newcomer to axial length. But her axial lengths were 25.9, right? And uh, for those of us who are in the axial length world, we get really nervous when we get close to that 26 number. Yep, because it's got a greater risk of a, of complication, uh, visual impairment, and blindness goes up. Um, in in it, you know, about 25 percent in eyes that are over 26 millimeters, and 90 percent in those that are over 30 millimeters. And so it just <clears throat> those striking numbers about this young lady, it's only a two and a quarter, but she's got a big eye. And yeah. uh, so we have to be thinking about that. And I think you're right. As we get more into axial length, I think primary care is going to grab on to myopia more. I think you're yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had a, a I did a, I had a dispensing visit today for a new fit ortho K kid. And I did the evaluation in August and, and for whatever reason, my schedule, their schedule, things got rescheduled. She, she finally came in today, two months later to pick up her molds for the first time. And I threw her back on the axial length and she had already progressed a 10th of a millimeter in two months. So, Uh you know, it's like, I am all right now. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I may even have to retarget these lenses, you know, I mean, I, 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 cause I built them to a certain amount of myopic correction, but she is probably a little bit higher already by now. So, yeah. so and this is a nine year old. She approximately nine, nine, nine years okay. old. Yeah. Just turned. Yeah. So we would anticipate a 0.1 uh, millimeter change as about normal in an emetropic child for over the course of a year in, in right. maybe a six or seven year old and a nine or 10 year old, we might be thinking a point eight point oh eight. Mm-hmm. Um, it, so already that big of a jump is a huge progression in just yep. a couple of months. Yeah, uh, it really is this up for our, for our colleagues because we're still so new to axial length. I don't mean to talk down to those of you who are using uh, axial length, but just those numbers need to be something we talk more and more and more about and have a better understanding um, of. And so that's an astonishing change, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I, and and I want to say one. I want to throw in one other little piece of advice about axial length monitoring. You know, it's not just for myopic kids. So you know, what were we trained in school, right? Oh, when you have a minus four, minus five, minus six, you, you know, you must dilate those patients, you know, that there's a higher risk of retina pathology. We've been talking about this forever. I graduated 25 years ago. I knew then that a big eye was probably potentially an unhealthy eye. Um, And so Mm -hmm. when I have patients that come into my office now, they could be 60 years old. They're a minus seven. I throw them on the machine because I'm curious what kind of risky eyeball I'm dealing with. 
you know, right. and sometimes you get those minus six or sevens that have a 25 millimeter eye. And sometimes you get them that have a 27 and a half millimeter eye. And it sort of changes, you know, your, you know, your approach toward those patients. So, you know, I just think it's an invaluable tool. Absolutely. So with regards to axial length devices that are out there, let's just talk through that just a moment. Um, you alluded to it becoming more available, and that's because of the addition of uh, things like the Myopia Master. So what what are you using in practice, Paul? What have you been using all these years? Well, I bought an IOL Master, mm -hmm. which is, you know, just a standalone device. And 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 I'll be honest with you, it was, it was used when I bought it four years ago, three or four years ago. Um, you know, because at that point, that's what we were kind of doing. I mean, well, let me, let me back up. I was using a, um, a contact, um, a device, you know, an ultrasound, um, device. And it was, it was working well for me. It was accurate, but it was a little challenging in that you have to anesthetize the eye, you know, you got to get right up in there. You know, some of the right. kids rejected it. It was a little bit more challenging. I couldn't delegate it to staff um, as much. And so when I decided to take the plunge into optical biometry, I didn't really, you know, at that time, I just thought, well, let me just call my local uh, equipment guy and see if he happened to have a used one kicking around. And he did. And so that's what I mm -hmm. got. And it's been remarkably accurate. And, and I can tell you, I mean, I don't know necessarily how to define the accuracy of it because I'm not comparing it on another device, but I see kids whose prescriptions change in equivalent amount of the axial length changes. And I see kids whose prescriptions aren't changing and the axial lengths are coming up the same and remarkably sometimes the same to the, to the hundredth of a millimeter, the same, I mean, you know, 23.56 and then six months later, 23.56. I mean, that's incredibly accurate, you know? So, yeah. um, so I, 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 I'm a firm believer and I don't really care what device you have, as long as you have a device, you know? Yeah. Um, I know the contact methods are probably a little bit less expensive to get into, and it might be a great place to start, but to your point now with, with all these multi, um, you know, multi-device machines out there that are measuring axials and, and the auto refractions, it's great. Right. And they build yeah. together, they, they build these beautiful algorithms and they spit out these wonderful reports. And, um, yeah. you can really show your parents like where the, you know, these, how these trajectory lines are increasing. And, um, and I just think it's, it's a, it's a fabulous thing to, to have in your practice. You really have to do it. Yeah. So I've been a, a, a big fan of um, trying to trying to lead the way of the average Joe, right? So what, what is the average optometrist doing? And I realizing that in my practice, just like every practice in the country, I have limited space to be able to add another piece of equipment, right? I, I, I've got pieces of equipment just sitting almost in hallways and I'm trying to find, but where do I put these, right? Yeah. And I'm sure you're like, I'm like everybody else in the country. And so, you know, the thought of, of, of buying a standalone machine, although I thought it was valuable, it just, re I really struggled with it. And I looked into doing a contact, uh, contact axial length measuring device, I, you know, and I, I just realized I wasn't going to want to, I wasn't going to be excited to do it on every kid every time. And maybe you were able to do that, but you know, when that four or five year old is coming into the office and they've been progressing and I'm kind of, kind of worried what's going to happen. I, I didn't want to have to be like, oh, we'll skip it this time. Cause I don't know if this happens with you, but if I tell my technicians, well, we'll skip it this time. It's amazing how many times they skip things on patients and, <laughs> and they just don't do them. And so I, I'm getting on board with axial length now that I can replace another device in my office with something that also has it. And that's where the myopia master, for instance, fits in really well because I can replace an auto refractor. And right. every time I want axial length, I want to know what the auto refraction is, right? You know, I'm always checking their prescription anyway. So, 
And then, you know, there's other devices that ha have topography and, uh, and, and, um, and biometry and, you know, like the Pentacam, which is the, you know, the crux of all devices that are out there, just a fantastic device. As, as we get into this more and more, and I think in practice, and I do believe there's going to be some devices that are handheld, non-contact um, biometers in the, in the future. As we get more of that, I think we're going to be seeing how axial length is driving more people to do yeah. myopia management. But I never want the lack of doing axial length to be the reason somebody does not do myopia management because we can still do it with the refractive correction, right? My Absolutely. grandfather didn't wait to treat glaucoma until he had, you know, an OCT, he never had one. He had this machine that was this big, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, about the, about my shoulder lengths from uh, in size that he was measuring people's pressures with. And that's yeah. the way he originally started checking pressures in people's yeah. eyes. And, uh, you know, we treated a lot of glaucoma patients just based on pressures for years. I we totally agree with you. Care. Yeah, so mm -hmm. we, I think we'd all agree standard of care is now OCT, and we will get to that point with axial length. So I'm Absolutely. in full agreement. Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, you can start managing my, myopia cases today and get the axial length machines later. I mean, mm -hmm. we have the capability of putting bifocal lenses on eyes. We have the capability of prescribing atropine. Um, and so I agree with you. I... I it, waiting is not going to necessarily be good for your patients and, and for the, you know, and for the industry right. at large, but um, with the goal of I'm going to get there, you know, I'm going to get one of these machines, but I'm going to start today taking care of these kids because everything you do today is just going to make their future a little bit better. I mean, you know, not, like I said, not everybody has to be a guru, but I think it is, um, I think we are all uniquely qualified and competent to use, um, if not all, many of the device, uh, of the, you know, uh, protocols that are available to us today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What else are you seeing is, um, is coming into your practice or is changing your myopia practice within the last five years or so other than this axial length? Or what do you see is going to be changing it in the next five years? What's what's exciting for you? Um, I don't know if it's as exciting as it is concerning. Uh, you know, uh, uh, more and more younger and higher myopes are coming in. Um, and so, you know, I, I it the need for it is so now. You know, the kids are coming in younger and younger and younger, already myopic. Um, yeah. and so, so that is very concerning to me. What, but what's exciting, I think, is that parents have really woken up to this situation. They've really woken up to this condition and this, this disease, you know, um, yeah. I have parents coming in asking for this. We have people calling up the office and asking for it. Mm -hmm. You know, when I first started doing this, I had to tell parents what <laughs> the deal was. Now they're coming in seeking this care. So, uh, you know, I think that's great. I think that's exciting. And the other thing that's exciting, as I mentioned to you, I'm, I, I work with fourth year students. They're excited about this too. You know, they're, they're coming in their fourth year and, and third year and fourth year, and they're coming out of school really wanting to dig into, you know, managing this condition. Um, right. And that's probably the most exciting thing. Um, yeah. for me is that the, the new breed of optometrist is taking this seriously, you know, and they're, and, and, and hoping to jump into it. And, yeah. and you saw it because you were, you know, you, you were at vision by design, you were at boot camp. You saw the excitement in, in that, in, in those rooms, especially by the young docs. Yeah, no, it's absolutely exciting. And, uh, I'm really looking forward to, uh, you know, the, the next wave, it, it seems as if it's becoming easier to convince people on the benefit of myopia management, because they're seeing them in their practice as they're graduating, they're getting excited about it. It's something new, you know, to the statistic of we're seeing it younger and more often, we know 
that there's something new called quarantine myopia. And in China, in the study of thousands and thousands of children entering entering into uh, the age of six years of age, before and after, we saw a 15.8% uh, increase in the prevalence of myopia in six-year-olds over the course of two or three years. So that means that 16% more myopes were uh, starting the age of six than uh, than just a couple years earlier. And we're seeing that in the United States. I know we're seeing it on the West Coast. You're seeing it on the on the East Coast. Um, but it's happening everywhere. And uh, and it's a it's a big deal. I, I couldn't agree with you more that this is um, this is the time. Right. And, and uh, it's, it's nice to be in this arena. And as, as Craig Norman said on one of my first podcasts, myopia management has become a 20 year overnight success. Right. <laughs> we're, we're there. Everybody's yeah. catching on to it, but it's taken us 20 years to it's get it. It's good. There. Yeah. That's yeah. a perfect Craig line too. Yeah. Um, you, you, the other thing that is exciting is it, it, as much as I'm frustrated by it, I'm excited about, we mentioned it before, you know, these optimized spectacle lenses, because, um, you know, listen, let's be honest, not everybody is a candidate for a contact lens. Not everybody is comfortable with a contact lens. Um, not everybody's going to wear one, but you know, when, when we can put, when we can, these spectacle lenses, the early studies on these things show really, really good data to help, you know, slow the progression rates down. And so it's a crime that we don't, we don't have access to these yet in the U S right. I don't have good data on this, but I have heard rumblings that by the end of um, hopefully 2023, early 2024, we're having this stuff, but I'm really hoping it's a heck of a lot sooner than that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the data before the FDA is certainly there. And if they get approval, we should have them before the end of 2023. Um, and if they don't get approval, then hopefully it will only be 2024. And so I think your yeah. data is just as good as anybody's on, 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 on what's happening. And so hopefully that will, will be the case. Well, I respect uh, be, to be respectful of your time. I sure appreciate you uh, chatting with me, sharing some great insights, axial length, and what's new and where we're going. It's uh, been awesome chatting with you, my man. Thank you. Yeah, for, it's been terrific. For the Myopia podcast. Yeah, Thank you so it. much for inviting me on. I, 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 it's a great thing you're doing, and uh, I really appreciate it. Thanks, my man. And right, thank you thanks. for joining us for this episode of the Myopia podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe. Stay tuned for. More episodes coming up next. One, two, three, Thank you for tuning in to the Myopia podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review and don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.